1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 24, the New Living Translation reads it like this. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I like the way this translation uses that word shadow boxing. Shadow boxing is a form of exercise where you're pretty much boxing with nothing. Paul's saying, I'm not just going through works that mean nothing. There's purpose behind the race I'm running. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do whatever it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Then we flip over to Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the inspiration of your word. We thank you for the challenge of your word, Father, but we thank you for the depth of your word. So we open your word today, Father, in this time that we have together to understand that you have great purpose for each person in this room. Not only do you have great purpose for their life, but you have purpose for this house, for Heritage Fellowship. So this morning, we're joining together to get in the game and to be victorious in this game. So I pray that you bless the reading of your word, that you anoint me as I deliver your word, Father. I pray that the anointing that's in this room, Father, would minister to every heart and every life of every person. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can we celebrate the word of God this morning and thank him for it? Amen. So here we find Paul. And in, in, the, in the Corinthians passage, Paul, when he's talking about this whole game and this whole race, he's He's, again, using an analogy. He's painting a picture because he's referring back to games which were held every two years in, in Corinth. And, and there were these athletes, they would come together and they fought this, these fights and ran these races all for a crown of leaves. So that they could wear the, that victory crown. These football players, they, they, they had a dream since they were on a high school football field. Most of them had a dream since they were like five years old and they were playing peewee football and the shoulder pads were bigger than they were and the helmet was slapping around on their head. And, but yet they had a dream that one day they could play the game and wear the ring. A ring that's designed like no other. A ring that makes a statement like no other. All for the ability to be crowned champion. So that everybody will scream and yell and they've achieved the highest level of success in their sport. Paul is painting that same picture because when these games would take place, they would, they would compete all for this crown of leaves. But Paul was trying to get them to realize that there was a greater crown. That there was a greater prize that had lasting significance. There was something far beyond any feat they could ever have, any, any championship they could ever win, any crown they could ever receive on this earth, that there was a fight to be fought, a race to be run for something greater. Everybody say greater. In Heritage, I want to encourage us as a church family this morning. I want to encourage us to run this race together. 
God has been doing some great things and some, some supernatural things, and we believe that as we continue to press on in 2015, that it wasn't just for a month of January, but it's a lifestyle. I believe that we'll still see God perform breakthroughs and miracles. And somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, pastor, what if I don't ever see that crazy miracle? Here's the reality. The greatest miracle that could ever take place is that one would be saved and have security that they are saved and going to spend eternity with their heavenly father. That's the greatest miracle that could ever take place. That's the reason we see the one time in scripture where they brought the lame man and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. They said, no, he needs healing. He says, well, what's, what, what's easier to do? Okay, then be healed. But, but the greatest miracle is that we would be saved. The greatest miracle is wrapped up in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the greatest miracle ever. But I believe that in, in 2015 that we'll see not only the miracle of salvation, but we'll see the, the miracle of, of healings and signs and wonders. And in your life, some of you have been crying out, I, I just need purpose. I need direction. I need understanding. Purpose will be revealed. Restoration will continue to take place. And as a church body, we will be in alignment with his will and not our own will. We'll be connected vertically to him and horizontally to one another. We'll love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and we'll love our neighbor as ourself. I was so encouraged last night as I was um, scrolling through Facebook, and um, I, I keep up with Facebook because that's how I find out a lot of times who's sick and who's not. And, but one of our church members just sent a message to another one of our church members that just said, We're, my wife and I are so thankful for you and my, our life. Thank you for your encouragement. You're leading us in a place of the Lord that we haven't been before, and I just say thank you, and I value you. That's, that's kingdom connecting right there. That's, under, that's two people that have a heart that's connected to him, but they're also connected to one another, being the hands and feet of Jesus, bringing encouragement to our brothers and sisters. And when we do that heritage, the kingdom of God is advanced. Listen, the kingdom of God will be advanced through this ministry, but every day the kingdom of God can be advanced through you. If you get in the game, look at your neighbor and say, get in the game. So this morning, I'm going to give you uh, five traits very quickly that I believe God throws at us in life to be victorious. I believe there'll be some traits that we'll see on a football field tonight that represents years of development and I believe that there's traits that we read throughout Scripture, and we actually find in those two verses that I just read right there, those, those two passages of Scripture, they're traits that God literally throws at us. The question is, will we catch them and run with them? Because tonight's game is around this, to be caught and to run to the end zone. Because the more times you can get this pigskin in the end zone, the greater chance you have to win the game. So God is throwing, good job, coach. So God is throwing some traits at us that we find throughout Scripture. The question is, will we catch them and will we run with them? The first one we find is desire. Everybody say desire. 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 Every champion has a strong desire. There's something they go to bed thinking about. There's something that they wake up thinking about. They pattern their life after it. The desire simply means to long for or to crave or to want, kind of like that piece of chocolate that many of you were craving at the end of a 21-day fast. Last week, Nicole and I were so humbled how the response, um, I, I didn't know how many people would stay around and allow us to pray over you and your family um, but we were so humbled at what, what took place during that moment. And we were so just overwhelmed. And there was a, um, um, we left here, I don't know, I think we prayed for people to almost 1.30. And, and you stayed. And so we were staying with you. And we got in the van to leave. Um, you know, I'd been on this fast. And, and my, my parents said, we can go anywhere you want. So I drove over to Kentucky Fried Chicken because I just needed some fried chicken. I just needed some mashed potatoes and gravy and a hot biscuit. I just needed it. 
And when I was going in for my third piece, my wife says, remember that weight you lost? But I, there, was a, there, there was a longing, there was a craving because I had been without. I was, I was so moved at desire that I saw in people as they stood down this, this aisle. About an hour into it, a young man came and stood by himself. And by the time he got up here, this was about an hour into the prayer time. About an hour into it, and he just was weeping. And he could literally almost stand. Some of you were here, and you witnessed this with, with Nicole and I. And I, and, I, and I called him forward, and he said, Pastor, I don't need a blessing. I need salvation. And right there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and he stood for an hour wrestling and he later said, I've been battling drugs, I've been, I've, been, I've been battling these addictions, and this morning I'm ready to give in. He says, but pastor, I wanted to walk out so many times. I wanted to walk out, but he said there was a desire in to, in, inside of me that I knew if I could get down here that my life would change forever. Because my friend, when you have every opportunity to walk out on God, but there's a desire in you that says, I am not, I'm going to push through till I see the victory. Listen, somebody don't stand in line for an hour to receive salvation when they can be eating someplace and having lunch someplace unless there's a desire to have an encounter with God. I don't know what you've been facing, but I want to remind you of what Paul said. Paul said, I'm going to run with it. I'm going to run after it. There's a desire in the midst of every single person. There's a desire that's in the midst of us to be victorious in life, but there's also a desire that's been placed in humanity after God. There's a desire inside of you to see victory come in your situation. Oftentimes, though, we don't want to run the race. I saw a cartoon on Facebook this week. Somebody posted, and it was a cartoon drawing of some people that were lined up for a race. And, they, and, and these uh, cartoon characters, let's just say they didn't look like your avid runners. They didn't look like the marathon champion. And over the top of it, it says... The annual instant gratification zero mile fun run. <laughs> and then it shows the, the starter a little ways down, and he says, Runners, take your mark, get set, go. Okay, now come get your free t shirt. They didn't want to run, they just wanted instant gratification. And so often, that's what happens with us when we lose desire for him. When we lose the desire for him, we get in this place where we just want instant gratification. We just want the t-shirt to say that I'm a Christian. We just want the t-shirt to say I'm a part of Heritage Fellowship. We just want the t-shirt. We don't want to run the race. Desire causes us to run the race. The Bible tells us in, in Psalms 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we refer back to that so often. I believe that what's happened over these past 21 days is that some of you have tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord like never before. But that that takes place in Psalms 34 is just um, a reaction to what is taking place from verse 1. And I just want to read some of this to you because some of you need to just post this somewhere in your life and make this declaration. Psalms 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You wonder why I tell you make these declarations? The psalmist is saying, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Open your mouth and say so. I love that song we just sang. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It doesn't say let the redeemed of the Lord just keep it in our hearts so nobody hears. It doesn't say let the redeemed of the Lord just stay quiet. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Make the declaration. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall, be, shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angels of the Lord Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Then he finally gets to that point. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who finds refuge in him. 
taste and see that the Lord is good. He's going on this rant about blessing the Lord, declaring the Lord, exalting the Lord, being humble before the Lord. And then he's like, you know what? If you'll just get a taste, you'll understand what I'm saying. Desire. Everybody say desire. Because too often we push back desire because of life's trials. Week one out of this 21 day prayer and fasting, twice this week I've had late night phone calls from people that had unexpected situations that they didn't see coming. But the Lord. And in both conversations, they just said, Pastor, I just want you to be praying with me, but I know the Lord is good. Desire. Number two is discipline. Discipline is the fuel. Discipline is the fuel. Because the, the reality is that God throws us the opportunity to be disciplined in life. Good hands, Pastor Jeremy. He throws us this opportunity. But let's face the fact. We always don't like discipline. Discipline's the hard part. The training is the hard part. But I believe discipline is the fuel. The bottom line is you can go down to Lexus right now and you can walk in that showroom and buy the prettiest car they have and the most expensive one. But if you don't put fuel in the tank, it's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. What happens to us so often is we leave church like that showroom car. There's a new glow about us. There's a freshness that's come over us. We've been polished, we've been shined up, but we don't go through the process of the daily discipline to live a victorious life. Church should be the, the time that we come together and receive the word and, and encouragement and rejoice together and celebrate together. I love to celebrate wins. I love to celebrate it because it's a reminder that our God is still building victorious people. But so often we just walk out the door and we don't add the fuel. And that's what happens so often is we don't keep the daily fuel. So it causes us to lose desire. When Nicole was training for, that, for the Chicago Marathon, I watched desire. Last time I saw her run like that was when she chased me. But there was a training regiment that was put on our refrigerator. There was a meal plan in place. There was a, when I was eating fried chicken, she was eating grilled chicken. There was a, there was a desire to get up at, sometimes she'd get up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning and go out on these long 20-mile runs because she knew by 7 that there would be an infant crying. There was discipline. I just continued to lay prostrate before the Lord and prayed for her. <laughs> but the discipline behind it was the reason that even though she had a knee injury when she went and ran the Chicago Marathon, she still crushed her time for a personal record and beat the time that many said it won't happen because of the injury. Discipline. Somebody say discipline. Say, Pastor, what does that have to do with me? This maturity that we find in walk with Christ doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen on a Sunday morning. It doesn't happen on a Wednesday night. It happens in your daily routine in the training regiment that you've put in place so that you can be victorious. That's the reason I called the church to a 21 days of prayer and fasting. Not so we could just say, look at us at how good we are. Look at us. We pray and fast. It had nothing to do with that. But some of the greatest stories that I received during the time of prayer and fasting were the ones that... that, that Discipline themselves, and they said, Pastor, God has done things that he's never done before. And in those moments that the cravings came in, I stayed disciplined, I stayed committed to it, and I saw it through. And because of that, this is what God did. He, he will encourage your faith. He will strengthen you. We find it all throughout the Bible. 1 Timothy 4 tells us to train yourself to be godly. Hebrews 12, 7 tells us that we have to endure hardships. For you football fans, you may remember former Dallas Cowboy coach Tom Landry. And 
he made this quote, and when I read it this week, I was like, that's good. It says, the job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. The job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. We say so many times, man, this is hard. This makes me uncomfortable. This is a little out of my comfort zone. And I believe that what God is saying all along is he's saying, stretch with me. I'll enlarge your territory. Stretch with me. I'll do something that you've never seen before. Discipline yourself. Stay focused and see it through. The third one is this. The third one is commitment. 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 Are you committed or are you not? God says there's commitment. I'm throwing it out there. Are you going to be committed to the game or not? Say, Pastor, are you really referring to life as a game? Yeah. You ever had something happen in life and you just thought it was so devastating, but because God saw you through it, you look back on it, you just kind of chuckle? You kind of chuckle and you think, wow, it wasn't as bad as I thought. Because God saw us through. Commitment. Focus and commitment. Everybody say focus. Focus. And commitment. Focus and commitment calls you to perform at a higher level than you've ever competed at before. The, the focus and the commitment to a game is what will cause football players to stand on a field tonight and one of them to be crowned champion, to one of them to wear the ring, for the other one to go home. Listen, the great thing about God and the race that we run in life is this. If we stay committed to him, if we stay focused to the, to the prize, that's the reason we put the goal uh, signs back here around the focus sign because the goal is to simply stay focused. Stay focused in what? Stay focused on the author and the finisher of, of our faith. Stay focused on the one that declared you'll be the head and not the tell the first and not the last stay focused on the one that says it doesn't matter what giant you face if you stay committed to me if you stay committed and focused on what I've declared over your life you will see it through to to stay focused on the one that even though hardship comes and battles come our way and we got 160 pounds of weight on our back and we're in the death crawl and we feel like we can't make it to stay focused on the one that will empower us to say Holy Spirit I can't do this any longer I need a fresh endowment of your power. I need a fresh outpouring of your presence. Some of the things that some of you are walking through right now, some of the the things that have been pressing against you, your prayer simply needs to be, Holy Spirit, I just need a fresh dose of your presence. I need a fresh outpouring to help me rise again, to help me push through this again. I believe that God is like that football coach that's just there yelling, saying, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit, stay committed committed. If we stay committed, we'll be victorious. If we stay committed, we'll be victorious. Paul was saying in these passages of scriptures, there's a greater reward. There's a greater prize. Run with it. Pursue it. Push through it. Commitment. Everybody say commitment. Commitment is a, is a trait, and if we will stay focused, because when we're not focused, we become double-minded, and, and we probably all know what the Bible says about that. When we're double-minded, we become unstable in all of our ways. Listen, stay committed, because the one thing we find throughout Scripture, the ones that stay committed got their breakthrough. The ones that stay committed became victorious. Oh, Paul was, Paul was taken out, not in a, in a pretty way. But you know what? When he took his last breath, he received his ultimate reward. If we stay committed, not only will we be victorious in this life, but there's a greater, greater, greater reward that's awaiting us. Look at your neighbor and say, stay committed. Last two points 
are very quick. Number four is sacrifice. Sacrifice. You say, so Jesus throws sacrifice to us? Yeah, he says, sacrifice. I'm giving you an opportunity. Say, Pastor, where are you going with this one? Here you go. Understanding sacrifice, you have to understand this. Understanding sacrifice is the ability to understand you have to give up to go up. You have to release something in order to step into another level. Sacrifice keeps us humble. Sacrifice helps keep us, helps us to keep the main thing the main thing. It's called paying the price. Paying the price. You've probably heard me say this before. To dream is free, but the fulfillment of the dream costs greatly. The fulfillment of the dream is sacrificing. It's putting our, our preferences aside and saying, I'm focused on your purpose. You've heard that before. When, when we get to the place where we say, like Paul did, I'm not giving up, I'm pressing on. There's some things that we will have to sacrifice. Some of us, your next step in your walk with the Lord has everything to do with your heart to serve. Some of you are so passionate about getting to church and receiving, but you don't want to do anything with the overflow. The Word of God says that I'll keep pouring in as long as there's a willing vessel. I'll keep pouring in. And Jewel taught this last week when he was teaching about giving, the overflow, that that runs over would be a blessing with. Some of us are so full that we're just running over onto the ground and we're just coming back and trying to get full again. Sacrificing is saying, you know what, I'm going to give a little bit extra of my time and I'm going to serve. I'm going to engage. I'm going to get in the game at a level I've never been in the game before. I'm not just going to show up and get dressed, but I'm going to position myself so that I can make a difference. A little pastoral moment. That's the reason Nicole and I were talking to you about services and, and our children's ministry. These areas for you to connect because it's so important to the life of a believer to serve. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. Do you remember when he grabbed the towel and he knelt down and they said, no, 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 you can't wash my feet. He said, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm showing you what happens when you serve. The woman that takes the very expensive bottle of perfume and pours it out on Jesus' feet and washes his feet with it, um, Judas, some of the other ones are saying, no, 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 you can go sell that and make a lot of money. But she worshiped. She sacrificed in order for a special encounter. Oh, there's a lot of things we can do with our time. But what if we sacrifice a, a portion of it to serve? To take this that God is putting into us and placing into us. The goal is focus. Focus. Focus on a well-rounded believer. You guys have probably already learned, I love church. I love to celebrate. I love to shout. I love when the Spirit of God just moves and and I know that maybe this is a little different than what I, way I've been preaching, and maybe it doesn't have you shouting as much, and maybe you just don't have those goosebumps running up your spine. That's okay, because this is the foundational stuff that gets us in the game and keeps us in the game. The shout don't keep us in the game. The shout doesn't throw us out of the game. It's just a part of the game. It's the time we, 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 we celebrate, and we did that at the beginning of our service. Now I'm just trying to lay some foundational truths for balance reasons. Because we all have to sacrifice. We all have to sacrifice and give of ourselves, And that's when Paul was saying, I'm pressing on. Listen, these players that we're going to see play tonight, I believe they're in the position they're in because at some point they made greater sacrifices than others. Sometimes it comes down to talent and ability. A lot of times it comes down to the heart of sacrifice. I know a lot of great talent that lost its opportunity because they weren't willing to sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. 
And the last one is this, the last trait that he'll throw at us. And you say, Pastor, you're saying throw. Yeah, because they're in here. They're in here. These are all throughout the word of God. Tonight, this ball is going to be thrown. Well, well, not this one. I guess they could use it if they want. Maybe we can call and tell the Super Bowl they can use this ball. <laughs> hold on, hold on. This one's a little soft. This one's a little soft. Why do you think I'm throwing so good? No way. Take some air out of those jokers. But here's the thing. God has one more trait, and really, it's the most important trait. It's the trait that if you ever take the opportunity and you study the life of Abraham and you study the transition from Abram to Abraham, you'll find that there was a promise that was declared, but it took about 25 years before he got this, before he held the promise. And along the journey, there was some things worked out. There was some things that God had to straighten up. He responded, he responded to the word, and he kept the promise in front of him. But there's even a time in the journey that he got out of the will of God and he received the problem instead of the promise. But there was something that God was working all the way until he could release the promise. And it's called character. It was called character. Just kidding. <laughs> character. Everybody say character. Every time I think about character, I think about this saying that I learned a long time ago when I was a youth pastor. I used to use this all the time. I believe your character traces all, all the way back to, a, to an original thought. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your action. Your actions become your habits. Your habits form your character, but your character determines your destiny. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits form your character. Your character determines your destiny. We serve a gracious God. We serve a miracle-working God. We serve a faithful God. We also serve a God that watches our character. All through this transition from Abram to Abraham and to the promise, there was character shifts. And I believe that in some of our lives, I'm not saying if you're going through trials, it's because your character's bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. Trials will come, trials will go. That's the reason Hebrews tells us to endure them. You, gotta, you, you, you endure, endure them. You, above all, you just stay, stay the course. But we have to watch our character. Stand with me this morning. We have to watch our character because our character is literally that element that integrates all of these together. Our character is that element that integrates desire and discipline and commitment and sacrifice together. Our character is like that secret glue that just causes them all to form and to fall into alignment. The reason I came into this year declaring alignment in your life is because when we're out of alignment, we step out of his will. Amen? Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 9, verses 26 and 27 as we get ready to close this morning. I, so if I want to read it to you out of the Message Bible. It reads like this out of the Message Bible. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. Some of you feel like that. Whew, I'm giving it everything I got. Don't know how much I have left. It says, no sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping or telling everyone else all about it and then missing out for myself. That last part's the part I really love, Jeff. I'm not going to get caught up just telling everybody about it and miss out for myself. I'm, I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep pursuing. Tonight, you're going to watch a game. Most of you, some of you are just going to watch the commercials, whatever it is. But you'll find out eventually who wins. 
And you're going to find out who wins, and it's going to be the team. And the whole desire and the sacrifices they made in their life was the ability to perform at the highest level possible in their specific field. But I'm not here to just talk to you about living victorious. I want to be a victorious believer. It doesn't mean trials won't come. I'm, I'm, I'm a big boy. I can handle a lot. I have tough skin. I was the little guy in the family that got beat up all the time, but I learned how to take those cheap shots. Because sometimes the enemy comes against us and we push him back, but then he pops right back up again. And then we want to push him back and he comes right back. And he's still there behind us. And he's pushing in on what seems to be our intended goal. But what God gives us the ability to do, and we find it in Ephesians, Paul said, after you've done all you can do to stand, you stand therefore. There's an enemy over here, and I'm going to knock him down, but he's going to come back, and I understand there's an enemy here that's going to get knocked down, he's going to come back, but it doesn't change my God. He still illuminates where he wants you to go. And the goal is simple. I'm, I'm a simple guy. I'm a simple thinker. Here it is. He says, be focused on me. Push the enemy out of the way when he needs to be pushed out of the way. Allow my grace to step in to be the pushback in life. But don't lose focus. My prayer for you is this. Let's get in the game. There's two parts to this message this morning. The desire of my heart. First one is this. That you will get in the game. Personally. And in your individual families, like never before, and you'll be victorious believers. In spite of whatever weight you're having to carry. But for us as a church family, can we get in the game like we never have before? Oh, I've been in the game. I've been in the game. You've been in the game. But I'm talking about, can we step into a new season? See, two teams are playing tonight that at the beginning of a new season... They said, Coach, we're getting in the game like never before. We're going to a higher level than ever before. It's a new season for our lives. Can we get in the game like never before? Can we have a fresh desire like never before? Can we sacrifice at a level like we never have before? Can we commit and engage in a way like we never have before? Can we be protectors of our character so that we don't shine negative light on the gospel of Jesus, but when somebody sees us, they see the bright light of love and of hope and of power and dominion because that's what God desires for us to be. Can we get in the game together? like never can we pursue like never and this is what i feel my responsibility oh man i just want to be god's mouthpiece to be the coach saying don't quit don't quit don't quit teenagers don't quit don't quit jesus hasn't forgotten about you he loves you he desires to empower you don't quit don't quit. Don't quit. Noble, don't quit. Tom, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Keep going. Keep pursuing because I understand blindfolders may come throughout the journey. Blinders may be put on us. I understand heavy weights may fall upon us. But you know what I love and it doesn't get much airtime in that clip is if you notice because there was one that was willing to respond to the coach's voice, it caused the other team to move from the position of complacency to the position of victory. Paul didn't say lay down, and when it happens, it happens. He says, after I've done all I can do to stand, I stand therefore. The Bible tells us that David stood and, faith, and faced Goliath. The Bible tells us Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fiery furnace, but they began to walk about. Stand. We get in the game. We get in the, in the game and we engage to be victorious. 
Let's pray this morning.